hello, good evening. You're very welcome to join me again in introducing to you this series of Generations Revisited, the programme that I produced for Channel 4 television in the United Kingdom in 1986. I have gone through a lot of the participants so far, and I haven't mentioned my commissioning editor, but in this episode, episode six, I have to say that I think this may have won me the commission because John Renela was the commissioning editor for Irish programming and for religious programs. And in this episode, I had featured the granddaughter of Eamon de Valera, who was the leading statesman at the creation of the Irish state, who was head of state and the equivalent of our prime minister a number of times and was also associated with drawing up and actually writing and introducing the Irish constitution. So um, John Renella had written about Ireland and coincidentally on the day that I had my appointment with him at Channel 4 in Charlotte Street in London, he was late for the appointment and I waited in the foyer uh, for him. And this very nice receptionist kept telling me that there were very nice coffee bars in the area if I'd like to pop off. I didn't pop anywhere. I was rooted to the spot. This was a critical meeting. And John Renner, I understood later, had been up at BBC on the book programme being interviewed about his latest book on Ireland, which had received great acclaim. So he came back from that and I was waiting. And of course, the receptionist nodded over to me. Your two o'clock appointment is still there. And the meeting took place then up in his office and the deal was finalised. So it was a very happy event. And I think he liked the idea, what he referred to it, of Sheila de Valera being at that time the first of the grandfather's grandchildren. There were others, there have been others, but she was then the first to be in politics, to have followed the grandfather down that path. And she had loved history and had that in common with him as well. He had recognised that in her um, and they had great discussions and chats. She had very vivid memories of her grandfather and of her grandmother, who appears to have been quite a powerhouse behind the, the man in this story, as in so many, as we know. But she brought to the interview the pen and pencil set. Those of you who are old enough to remember, pens used to come, fountain pens, in a jewel set with a propelling pencil. And she brought this set with her as a memento of her grandfather, he had given it to her and it was very, very interesting um, for her to produce that and also to handle it and to see that on the side of the propelling pencil, um, and it was lovely, it looked like tortoiseshell or alabaster, very nice um, finish, but it was worn down. So he had pressed on it for so long with his finger that it had worn away. So I actually saw it and had it in my hand. Very interesting piece of history. And she was a very interesting connection to history, as you'll find in this piece. So I hope you enjoy listening to Sheila de Valera, a politician as she was then, um, talking about her recollections of her grandfather, Eamon de Valera. Thank you. Sheila, I'd imagine most people find it hard to resist the temptation when they meet you to ask you about your grandfather, and I'm not going to resist it, but does that irritate you? No, it doesn't. I think uh, many people are curious about the, uh, the kind of relationship a grandfather and granddaughter has when that grandfather happens to be very well known, both nationally and internationally. And so I suppose it's a question I am of asked very often, but uh, it's certainly understandable. I had an opportunity of knowing him very well because he didn't die until I was 20 years of age. And so I suppose I was lucky to see him both as a figurehead politically, as well, of course, as a grandfather and one that loved to have his grandchildren around him. And uh, perhaps many people might find it hard to believe because they sort of look on him as a very aloof figure. Mm. But uh, he was a family man, very much a family man. And of course, because of his uh, political 
uh, involvement all through the years. I think this might have been making up for the uh, loss of family life early on in his political career because very often he was away. And uh, indeed, older members of uh, the family, uh, my father's older brothers and sisters, um, and when they were very young, they didn't even know him. I mean, I remember my father telling a very interesting story where there was a newspaper report of my grandfather. I think he was in jail at the time or he had made an escape. And uh, one uh, uh, child said to the other, who's this fellow de Valera anyway? And my grandmother overheard them. And uh, the, uh, I think it was my Aunt Maureen said, well, I'm not too sure, but I think he's mummy's uh, father. So, you know, it was that uh, uh, difficulty, I suppose, and he lost out in the early years of his family, but certainly um, he loved to have us all around him. So your being the daughter of his youngest child led to your seeing more of him? Yes, well, I think we all did, uh, because the eldest uh, grandchild was Nora, and she had a tremendous uh, talent for mathematics. And so, you know, he obviously shared in that, uh, because he had a tremendous interest in mathematics. I think it was Einstein that said that he was um, one of the nine people at the time uh, who understood his theory of relativity. So um, he obviously had a, a very good knowledge of maths. And um, I remember him saying that he would have liked to have had the opportunity if politics hadn't encroached on his academic life, he would have liked to have had the opportunity of, of uh, furthering his interest in mathematics. But that wasn't to be. Did you see him regularly? Yes, we used to go up on uh, every Sunday when he was uh, president. And before that, uh, uh, I was only three when he became president, but the family used to go down to uh, the family house in Black Rock. So we we're very much a family unit. Did these visits centre around a lunch or a tea? Yes, there'd, there'd be at least one meal and then, uh, you know, all the children would be playing around and any normal family Sunday. Have you memories of mm. those meals? Yes, indeed, uh, many memories. Uh, the one thing I think people find hard when they they sit down with the the, the family of Devil Aries is that we all talk at the same time, but we managed to sort of uh, be able to um, uh, adapt in some ways and been able to take part in one conversation while initiating another. So I think, that's <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it was my um, my sister Jane, her husband Elio, who said that was one of the first thing he noticed when he sat down. Um, uh, with a meal with us all, that uh, he found it hard to get a word in edgeways. But uh, he's learning very fast, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> were you allowed access to him? Or were you told to play with him for a little while and then keep away or keep quiet? Oh, no, it wasn't at all a, a very formal a sort mm. of uh, atmosphere at all. Many uh, occasions, of course, people would call to see him or he'd, he'd have work to do. Or, and so he would be there for a short period and maybe have to go away and to attend to these uh, problems and then come back again. But uh, I remember uh, he um, taking a great interest. Uh, I loved riding and I used to go riding every Sunday. But of course, one of his children, Brian, was killed uh, when he was 20 in a riding accident in Phoenix Park. And so the one thing he would keep saying is be careful, be kuramuk, be kuramuk. Mm. And uh, I think it's sort of, you know, he would take a very definite interest in what we were doing. And, uh, our hobbies and all of the rest. And of course, uh, our academic achievements were important to both him and my grandmother. Your interests were very much encouraged. And there was um, a very important point, I think, and that was that although it was obviously a very political orientated family, there wasn't at any stage a feeling of politics been pushed down your throat. And perhaps that was more subtle in a sense, because you would naturally react against that kind of pressure if it was, you know, forever to the fore. But it was very different. Um, there was always, uh, your questions were always answered, but political discussion was never initiated by them. It had to be initiated mm -hmm. by you. And uh, I suppose you were lucky in a sense if you weren't just learning the facts and figures of history that you would learn, for example, in a history book, but that you heard from them about events from purely personal uh, side and I think that um, created an interest for me and certainly um, for my parents and indeed for the rest of the family all of us have this tremendous interest in history and uh, it was from that interest that uh, my political commitment grew because that's really I remember um, 
elections quite well and taking an interest in those. And uh, I remember after that, then when I went to college, I decided to do a history, politics and philosophy for my degree. And, um, you know, although there is a great um, interest in the fact that I was doing these subjects, my, my grandparents certainly showed a tremendous interest. And in fact, I think my grandfather showed a secret delight that I was interested in politics as well. But there is no question of having to choose such subjects that was totally left up to me. And it was because of that academic interest in politics, I think, that I decided, well, uh, I might as well have some practical knowledge of what political life is like. And so I joined the party and I worked at, uh, you know, voluntarily for uh, different election campaigns and that. And then things developed from there, really. Can you recall his reaction of pleasure? Yes, yes. What was that like? Yes. Uh, he was really very supportive. And uh, I think my grandmother gave some very um, practical bits of advice, like saying that um, she had seen an awful lot of bitterness in her day uh, because of, uh, based really on political views and that, and that it was important to, if at all possible, to divorce the personal from the political when, when dealing with people in a political sphere. Mm. And I've tried to remember that, and I think that gives you a very uh, different approach to people and to politics generally. I think you have a far greater respect then for people and you have a far greater respect for a different point of view. And only in that way can you really get to the, tru the truth and the heart of the matter. Mm. And um, I think that was always so to not just um, take a, a stance for the sake of it, but to make sure that you properly researched the area and that you had made a decision on, you know, the strength of an argument. And so um, I got great support from both of them on that. Those stories that you mentioned earlier, have you any memory of one in particular that had a great effect on you? Well, there's one that immediately comes to mind, and that was when uh, my grandmother used to tell me about uh, the very difficult times and the very sad and tragic times for Ireland, the Civil War, and uh, how sad it was that people who would be very great friends uh, up till then, then went their separate ways, if you like. <clears throat> and uh, she used to mention quite a good deal about Michael Collins. She had a great regard for Michael Collins and uh, they were good friends. In fact, it's not very often realised that uh, the Collins family and the de Valera family, they were, you know, they were, they were very uh, close in that sense. Certainly my grandmother had a great respect for him. She thought, of course, that it was sad that uh, they ended up on different sides, if you like. Mm. But uh, she remembered that uh, when he would come to visit, um, even during those difficult times up to 1922, that he'd always take an interest in the children, uh, Rory and Viv and Maureen at that stage. And uh, that he, she remembered well, his very strong Cork accent, I remember was one thing, and that he was a very jovial and very kind person. And I think knowing those sort of things about someone is, gives you a different insight than just seeing someone from from a particular ideology or theory it if you like puts the flesh on on such theories and approaches and i think it's important to remember that did your grandmother and grandfather laugh a lot together very much so yes my grandfather or my grandmother always referred to my grandfather as dev and uh, i remember well funny little instance like when granny would uh, break, bake cake my grandfather insisted that he hated eggs and of course, he knew absolutely nothing about cooking. And he'd say, well, now, Sinead, there's no eggs in this cake. Sure, there isn't. Oh, of course it's not, Dev. No, I know you don't like eggs. And to give us a big wink, you know. And uh, she caught at him again. <laughs> but uh, there's that very sort of easy um, and homely atmosphere. It's one of the things that I remember very well. Quite frankly, I miss. Did they read to you? Yes, well, my grandmother, of course, uh, wrote the stories for mm. children and that. And uh, I remember there's a special day for her when uh, they decided, uh, some people got together and they decided what they would do was to act some of her stories out in puppet form for children. And so we all got the day off school and we went up to watch this and she was thrilled that people took such an interest in that. And it's interesting too to note that no matter what people's political persuasions might be, they might think 
you know, they might be quite hostile towards Dev or the chief, as some people refer to him as. But they would always have, secretly otherwise, a soft spot for my grandmother because I think she could uh, get on with people very easily and she was a very quiet person. But some people might think that um, she was quiet and retiring. In some senses she was, but that didn't mean that she had a very strong personality. After all, she had a very difficult life, as you can imagine. I mean, from 1916 on particularly. I mean, if your husband is in jail or he was sentenced to death and you have a few young children to bring up and you don't know where the money's going to come from next and all of those terrible pressures. And yet she was really the person to have brought her seven children up and, and uh, so that she had to be a strong person to cope with all of those things. Do you recall being aware of her strength when you were small? Yes, very much so. She was someone that uh, you could depend on very much. She would always listen to what you had to say. She wouldn't just decide, right, well, this is, you know, the formula. You, you go through with this and you'll solve your problem. She listened to you and she um, had great time, especially for younger people. And uh, a great respect for your view, even though you might only be young. But uh, certainly as we got older and went through college and that, um, she was always interested in how we got on uh, and the friendships we made and, you know, the day to day things that are important to us. What would have annoyed her? And it would have been difficult to say, really. Um, I know that uh, she liked children to have manners. She didn't like children to crawl all over the place and that she wanted them to have respect for grown-ups, but equally she wanted the, uh, the grown-ups to realise that the children weren't just, you know, uh, little appendages. I mean, these were little persons all of their own. And so uh, it would have annoyed her if there, there hadn't been that kind of rapport. And what did she do about that? Well, even if the parent was there, she'd correct the child directly. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, she was very direct. Yes. In fact, um, she was known as Jenny. It was though she was only um, my sister Jane is called after her, but uh, she was only known as Sinead when she went into the Gaelic League. <clears throat> and uh, she was known uh, as Jenny by every other member of the family. And her sister, uh, no, her niece was once uh, heard to refer to ruthless Auntie Jenny. So uh, uh, that'd be my grandmother. So she, she was very strong, yes. Did you speak in Irish all the time at home? Uh, some of the time, but um, uh, not all. I mean, my grandmother was um, very, very good at uh, helping you out and teaching Irish, which she did for many members of the family. And, uh, but it was very much whatever way you wanted to converse. There was nothing that was, uh, there were no hard rules and regulations that had to be followed. It was all a very easy atmosphere. The best way really to, uh, cur you know, to um, conjure up an interest and a commitment to anything really, isn't it? First of all, to create the interest. And from there, then you begin to, you know, you have certain subjects and certain, and certain um, uh, subjects and that that would become your friends rather than a particular difficulty that had to be overcome. Did you, do you ever remember doing anything to make your grandfather angry or displeasing him in any way? I'm sure I did. <laughs> I just can't remember them, but uh, I'm sure I must have done. Did it matter a lot to you to please them? Uh, yes, in the sense that, um, as I was saying earlier, it's, it's nice to feel that uh, you're approved of. But I mean, everyone has this need for affiliation and for love. Uh, within a family, and that was very much there in ours. Did you have a clear idea growing up of what would have annoyed them or incurred their wrath? No, I can't honestly say. I can't honestly say that. Um, I, I can't think of any instance that, you know, I would immediately have said that would be unwise to do. Mm. You know, that wouldn't be acceptable. No. I suppose most people would think it was a great advantage coming from such a dynastic family. But were there any disadvantages? There were, of course. And what um, were they? Well, the disadvantages being that, as you said at the outset, um, when people meet you for the first time, they immediately tag on to the name. And so very often you get a reaction for or against that they judge you, they prejudge you, if you like, on their views or what they might have heard um, about your family or that. But I think people are willing enough to accept you then when they get to know you. And uh, I think there's some French um, 
um, proverb or something to say that uh, if you do happen to have a name that's well known, the important thing is for people to uh, know you uh, by your first name in the sense that then you've really managed to put across your own identity and they accept you for what you are and not what they think that you should be. Did you feel special when you were growing up? No, no. Um, certainly not. Again, it would have been uh, uh, my grandmother that would have had an influence. She would have said, uh, people will um, only think well of you for what you do yourself. And that's really the only thing that's worthwhile, what you achieve by your own effort. And uh, I think that is, uh, for all of us, something that uh, I think we would go along with. Did he depend on her a lot? In many ways, yes, because even through the years when he would uh, be uh, writing speeches or whatever, he would always ask her of you. And uh, very often she would disagree with it. And she'd say, oh, no, no, Dad, you couldn't possibly say that or you couldn't possibly feel that. Do you not know that, you know, uh, that mightn't be acceptable in that form or whatever? And she was marvellous at finding quotations, you know, very often they go down well in speeches. And uh, she was great at that. I mean, she'd know, she'd say, oh, yes, I have something that would that would be very appropriate there and she'd go off to a book or something and uh, she would find this for him. That's another thing I think that she instilled in us, uh, a love of books. I know that sounds terribly dull but <laughs> um, it is something that I share too, yes. Did she encourage you to any particular kind of reading? No, anything at all. Uh, but uh, again it would have been because of her interest in history and that, uh, you know, that uh, I would naturally, I suppose, uh, from that influence have gone on and found that that was my primary interest too. And so I'd read anything and everything uh, of a historical interest. Certainly. At what sort of age? Well, even I remember from 11 on showing, 11, 12, showing that this kind of interest. I remember even at uh, primary level, we had these little tiny yellow books, uh, very different to what's on the curriculum nowadays. But uh, they were little history books. And we had the McCarthy books as well, the history books when you grew older. And uh, although the texts were very dull, I suppose they hadn't got into this new way of presentation. But uh, I remember finding tremendous interest in men. For me, it was a, a story. That's always how I looked on it. I never worried too much about whether or not I'd got the exact dates about something, as long as I knew um, around about what period it was, so that I could begin to slot things in. And then when I was older, then I was able to recap on this and get things more accurately. Did you ever look back on that period through which your grandmother and grandfather had lived through the, the, the troubles, as they call them here, and projected yourself back and wondered what you would have been like if you'd lived through those days? Yes, I think that's something that um, people that would be interested in that period would do anyway. And uh, I often think um, about what it would have been like and what kind of decisions I would have made and, you know, what side I would have been on, if mm. you like, from any knowledge that I might have picked up through the years. And... Um, this sort of projection, I suppose, is something that, that interests you. Of course, you have to know that um, there's no way that you could do so accurately because mm. so many things have changed, so many attitudes have changed, our whole way of life really has changed. Mm. But um, I think the kernel of the arguments and the principles are still very much there. It's just a different approach to those mm. now. How do you think you would have been? I think I would have held very much the same views as uh, those who would have been on the anti-treaty side. Now, it's very easy to say because you're out of it and you're looking at it from a cool environment mm. and there's no emotional involvement in that case. But certainly in my beliefs nowadays, if I was to project those back, I'd find myself along uh, with people of the similar persuasion. Do you think you could have expressed a diverse view to your grandfather? Oh, well, yes. Well, it was quite open to do was that. It? it was quite open mm. to do that. And in fact, you'll find that um, even around the family now, uh, if you're discussing things, you'll probably find each person has a different view, but that there is this uh, climate where discussion is very important. And that although, you know, you, you really have to make sure that you have your argument straight <laughs> to go in there fighting, um, you know, I think it's a very healthy attitude to have, actually, because it clarifies your own view. Whether or not you might be in agreement is another matter, but it, it certainly clarifies your own view. And if you see any loopholes in your, your arguments, you know exactly where to patch those up and find more information or perhaps change your view. Mm. In those moments of closeness with your grandfather, did he ever talk to you about your future? In the sense that um, he, as I said, he would never have said, well, I would like you. 
you know, to go into politics or I would like some of my grandchildren to, uh, to sort of carry on in that way of life. He never said that. But certainly when I did show an interest, um, he was, as I say, very supportive. And he would uh, be willing to talk about uh, different times and different difficulties and how you should try and approach those. And, you know, to be strong and to be in a position of making a decision, but not first of all without finding out what everybody else thought. Did you ever sense an openness in his attitude to the contribution which women might make? Yes, I think so. I remember now it's very different to politics nowadays mm -hmm. where uh, women's involvement in uh, politics is much more acceptable than it was then. But yes, I don't think, I never got the feeling that just because I happened to be a granddaughter rather than a grandson, this, you know, really? it was such a pity, you know, that uh, a grandson didn't take on the interest. I never got that. And uh, after all, I suppose he encouraged people like Countess Markrich and that to remain in the political sphere and, you know, she became the first minister and all of the rest. So it wasn't just the token woman either. Mm. I mean, I honestly believe that she that he felt that she had a bil b ability mm. in that uh, sphere and a very deep commitment. Mm. And he respected a deep commitment. Did he? Um, yes, very much so. And um, I think that if very many people that he would have met during his career that would have been totally opposed. Um, there, there seemed to be this bond. Uh, it was very difficult to see nowadays, actually. I, I certainly don't see it in politics of nowadays, unfortunately, uh, from the little experience I've had. But you would see that there is a respect between uh, the two protagonists, if you like, because there wasn't this kind of personal attack, that that was something uh, which you just didn't go into, mm -hmm. that you were there, you were interested in an argument, and that uh, it was from there on in. And uh, certainly uh, that's something that he instilled in all of us. Do you think he liked women? He certainly didn't have any dislike, I would think. <laughs> um, uh, quite frankly, uh, it never, you know, nothing he ever said uh, would cause him to believe uh, that he had any particular feelings of, you know, that women shouldn't be involved in politics or anything like that, no. Are you conscious now that you're carrying on a tradition? Well, whether I do or not remains to be seen, but <laughs> um, certainly I'd like to carry on, not just because it's a tradition, though. I mean, that would be something that uh, I think would wear pretty thin in the world of politics, which is a, a tough business. Do you have a respect for the past? Very much so, yes. Very much so. Are you nostalgic? So. Uh, I suppose so, although that sounds uh, perhaps a bit sentimental, but I like uh, to be able to um, look back and to think about things and to have, sort of as the Americans would say, to find your roots. I think this has only certainly been, uh, uh, been realized uh, pretty recently, especially by young people, that you need to have an interest in the past. Okay, you'll have some people immediately being prepared to say, what's the past? We're here, let's live for mm. the present and the future. But I think if you have to, um, if you have to succeed at all and to be content, I think you need to have a knowledge of what's gone before. In fact, I remember Brian Farrell well because he lectured me in college um, in politics. But I remember him well saying that the history of yesterday was the politics of today, and the politics of today will be the history of tomorrow. And I think that really sums it up: mm. that you can't, you just simply can't, conveniently, however conveniently divorce or divide the past from the present because one naturally follows on from the other. It's a natural progression. What sort of things bring you back? Well, there's one coin here which I'd like to show you. I can't go all the way back uh, in my experience to 1647, mind you, but that's that the... Too? Yes, this is this coin. And the reason why it's interesting is that it's a Spanish coin and it was in the entourage of Owen O'Neill. And uh, he, uh, it was found in Dublin Castle, Owen O'Neill's coin. And it was certainly, if not his, it was definitely in the entourage. And it was presented to my grandfather. And because of the Spanish connection uh, uh, between, uh, because my mother came from a Spanish family as well, originally, Gonzalez was their name. And because of the, the Spanish connection on my mother's side and my father's mm -hmm. side, on their engagement, uh, my parents engaged with my grandfather gave them this. So I think that's nice, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, it's a, a bit later than naturally than the, the flight of the earls. But it was interesting on a, a political sphere then that uh, I was to meet one of the O'Donnell family 
uh, who lives now in Spain and who happens to be um, the spokesman for the opposition on foreign affairs. And so it was very interesting to meet up with what was originally a very powerful Irish family who had done very well in Spain. And uh, again, with the Spanish connection, it was interesting to follow through. And so these sort of things I find interesting. I like to be able to connect things up. <laughs> and what is this? Speaker? Oh, this is just, um, for me, it's just special because it's the pen and pencil set that my grandfather wrote the Constitution with. Oh, my and so it's nice. And the interesting thing is that you might see here on both pens, uh, he's carved this little bit away because it made it much easier to hold the pen. As you can see, it's much more comfortable to hold with that uh, little piece taken out of the pen. But you can see the, the pencil. He used a pencil an awful lot. He liked to draft everything and redraft in pencil, why, yes. Why have you found that in your hands? Gave it to you? Well, he gave it uh, to my father and my father gave them to me because I was the one that was interested in uh, political life and took part so in that. So that I value good, that very much. Yes, I do. Must be a very significant piece of your so, respect for the past. It is. Sheila, I've enjoyed this little amble with you into your very distinguished background. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.